that. Okay, good evening and welcome to Copperfield's Books virtual event with Mikel Jolet in conversation with Jessica Zach. My name is Jamie Madsen and I'm the marketing and events coordinator here at Copperfield's and I'll also be your host for the evening. Copperfield's Books has been committed to literature, education, and creating community together since our founding in 1981. Thanks for joining us in this virtual event community to help keep us feeling connected. As COVID-19 continues to endanger the future of independent bookstores like us, you can show your support and help keep us alive by purchasing a book through our online store. We thank you for your continued support. I'm thrilled to announce that all nine of our stores are still open for inside service and curbside pickup every day from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Just a couple of housekeeping items before I introduce tonight's speakers. We will be using the chat box to provide links to view upcoming Copperfields events, links to purchase Mikhail's latest title, as well as his audiobook, which is read by him, and we'll also include my contact details for post-event information. Additionally, the Q&A box will be your go-to tonight with any comments or questions for the speakers. The format will feature 45 minutes of speaking and we will then open for a live Q&A. We will try to get to as many of your, uh, of your questions as we can as your feedback is always appreciated. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see a Q&A icon. Please submit your questions here rather than replying to my post in the chat box. And without further ado, I'd love to introduce tonight's author. Mikel Jolet is an American author who is best known as the frontman of the indie band, The Airborne Toxic Event. Prior to forming the band, Jolet graduated with honors from Stanford University. He was an on-air columnist for NPR's All Things Considered, an editor at large for Men's Health, and an editor at Filter Magazine. He is here with us tonight to discuss his New York Times bestselling memoir, Hollywood Park. And in conversation with Mikel is Bay Area arts journalist, Jessica Zach. Jessica writes regularly about books, film, and visual culture for our very own San Francisco Chronicle. I'm thrilled to have them both with us this evening and I'm pleased to hand it over to you, Jessica. Thanks so much, Jamie. So Mikel, this is a, such a treat to be able to continue the conversation that we started a couple months ago. Yeah, that was a fun interview. Uh, you know, and it's so rare, you know this as you, you used to be a working journalist yourself, you know, when you're a reporter, you interview so many people, you have sometimes a wonderful conversation and then more often than not, you never speak to that person or see them again. <laughs> like this forced intimacy where you like end up having this great conversation, maybe the best conversation you've had that week with anyone. Yeah. And you're like, man, if I had just had that conversation over coffee with a friend, I'd be like, well, what are you doing next week? That was a great right. conversation. But then right. you never talk again because exactly. it was all just kind of like, forced to be part of this sort of unnatural setup between journalist and subject. Right. But so this is a treat that we can kind of pick up. In oh, a way where we left would... off. And it's also, I think, you know, it's really a testament to the visual and I think emotional potency of your writing that in picking this book back up, I wanted to kind of refresh myself. I hadn't looked at it in a while um, and realized I really didn't need to. It's fresh in my mind. I mean, you've just written such vivid scenes and they're still in here so thank you uh, it's no surprise that it's become a bestseller since we last spoke <laughs> oh that's very nice thank you very much yeah so i wonder you know you don't need to take people through the history of synanon but i do think it would be helpful to maybe give a little context you know your book starts with quite an emotional jolt you're about five years old your brother's a little older you're in the only place that you've called home um and it is in fact a cult not far from where i am right now actually um, and you're awakened by a woman that you learn is your mother and you flee and you're kind of your life journey starts there. But I think it would be helpful to give people a little bit of context of how did your parents, how did you end up in that situation? And, uh, you know, that Cinnamon was started as a more idealistic commune, a place where addicts like your father could get clean and did. Um, and then it spiraled into something, you know, much more sinister. Yeah, I think um, it's funny because I, I feel like a lot of what I talk about with this book is like I'm the cult guy 
And you read the book that I think the first scene is in the cult and then the rest of the book isn't in the cult at all. And, right. and there is a, a good, I'd say one of the four major motifs of the book is trying to unravel, you know, what the, what the cult meant and, and, you know, what I was told about it versus what it is. But so the short answer is I don't know that much off firsthand experience because we were, I, we were so young when, I, when we left, you know, we were woken up in the middle of the night and it was like, um, you know, I was, I was nearly four and a lot of those scenes I, I reconstructed with my brother's help. Um, and I had a couple, couple memories, like literally like three. And then he and I talked through it a bunch. And then I also interviewed other contemporaneous people who were there at the time and stuff. So, you know, um, I, there are kids from Synanon that were there till they were 15 and they know way more about it than, than I do. So I, I can tell you what I, what I've read, what I've studied, what I've heard, but I know yeah, it was, a, it was a drug rehabilitation place that people went to to get clean off of uh, heavy drugs. My dad uh, was a heroin addict. Uh, he got out of prison. He got an over. He'd been in prison for, in Chino State Prison for a few years. And um, he overdosed and someone took him there and was like, this is the place to go to get clean. And, and it worked. Yeah. He kicked on the couch. I mean, he sat there on this green couch in the lobby and he threw up and he shook and he did all the stuff you do when you're going through heroin, heroin withdrawal. And um, he, he kicked heroin um, and then he never went back, you know, and this all happened before I was born. You have to understand my dad, there was a lot of folklore around him, but my whole time I was alive, he was, you know, he never got a parking ticket. He was just a right. very, you know, sort of uh, straight, narrow guy. Um, and then my mom moved in when the squares moved in the squares. So they were the dope fiends. They called them the dope fiends. Mm -hmm. It's all very like sixties. Cool. It's weirdly, it's not hippie so much as beatnik. Uh -huh. I feel like people, there, there is a distinction there and some of it's a generational distinction because they're sort of like, they're baby boomers, but they're not really the hippie baby boomers. They're a little slightly older than that. And they're, and they're more like beatniks. They're more like, I don't know, the activism I would associate it isn't really the anti-war activism, although I think that was part of it. But like my mother was a free speech activist at Berkeley. Yeah. She mm -hmm. was involved in all the sit-ins and all that kind of stuff and all kind of like the people versus Reagan kind of stuff that happened. She was, you know, and she sat there arm to arm with people while they fired tear gas. And, and I think there was a sense that the world was coming apart, you know, um, and there was the war in Vietnam and it was very unjust and there were tanks on University Avenue and there was tear gas. And in some ways it was in that way, it was sort of similar to what's happening now. Uh, in that you just felt like the fabric of society was falling apart. I think it's in a different way now and for different reasons, but that was happening. And so the idea of joining a commune didn't sound as crazy as it does now. And they also didn't say, come join our cult. Because yeah. <laughs> who would fucking do that? You know, they, they, it was a commune and it was, a, it was a kind of, it was this utopian society that was going to change the world. So, you know, as cults are wont to do, the power started to get concentration, concentrated into too few hands. And, um, it became insular. It became paranoid. The, the leaders um, be, uh, took on too much power, um, and as as happens, um, and um, it, it became violent. Yeah. And uh, somewhere after that is when when we escaped. Right, right. And with that violence and neglect came how children were treated, and this yeah. same notion that children should be raised without parents to be children of the universe. I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we were all at six months old taken uh, from our folks um, and put into an, what was, they called it a school, but it was, it was an orphanage. I mean, it, I don't know what else you call a place where strangers raise you and you never see your parents and you don't know who your parents are. And right. you're sort of raised by this rotating staff of people. Some of them were great. Like some of the most wonderful people I've met in my life, truly well-intentioned, smart, good with children. Yeah. But then they were only there some of the time. Right. And so you still had this like sense of like, who are my people? And then, um, then some of whom were just downright abusive, right. you know, right. and um, you know, the kids uh, all, we were told, you know, we didn't know what a mom and dad was. We were told everyone in Synanon was our mom and dad, mm -hmm. which of course meant nobody was our mom and dad. And, and so, you know, we, like we knew there was this woman and her name was mom and we knew there was this man and his name was, Bad, but the terms didn't have any particular meaning to us because how could they? They weren't people we saw every day. They were—they weren't what I think most of us now would would think of as being, you know, um, parental figures. Because I, I, you know, we'd see them every few weeks for a couple hours. That was it, and then they disappear right. again. And so it was confusing because we yeah. were living in an orphanage and no one told us we were living in an orphanage and we were being abused and everyone told us we were special. We right. were the new experimental children who were going to go on and be this new type of human being that didn't need parents, and it was like. 
I, meanwhile, we're just lonely. Right. And that you really crazy. convey so beautifully that disorientation that you had when you left. I mean, it's, and it's disorienting in a really successful way for the reader because you just put us right in there of how everything was so strange when you left. All the things you're describing that you hadn't seen before and you couldn't define. When I was writing the book, I, I really wanted to start with a moment of confusion. Mm -hmm. I wanted the reader to not quite know what was going on for the first 15 pages. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a child speaking. Um, this child has a big imagination. Uh, are we in a post-apocalypse? Like, is this, or is it the yeah. robot? Like, there's, there was this sense of, I want it to be, like, you don't understand what the world is as a reader. Um, I wanted there to be lies on the page that you knew were lies. Mm -hmm. I wanted you as a reader to start to try to untangle those lies. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted you to watch um, some magical realism happen. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a few reasons for that. Um, one, it just instinctual, like the short answer is instinctually, it felt more exciting to write it that way. And then when I, when I consider like, why, okay, why is that true? And I think it's because that's how I experience it. That's probably how we experience the world as, as children. I think we forget that the world of children is filled with a lot of magic, yeah, a lot yeah. of mystery and a lot of violence and a lot of imagined violence and a lot of metaphor and that you know probably the more let's say if i i have some literary aims obviously with this with this book and you know i think my argument with memoir as a form is these are the ways that we construct our personality mm -hmm. these are the ways in which we are the unreliable narrators of our lives these aren't these aren't the tropes of fiction these are the tools of the construction of identity and yeah. so if I'm going to write a memoir, which is essentially trying to answer the question, every good memoir answers the following question. How was the world for you? Mm -hmm. How was this world for you? How was it? Mm -hmm. And so my attempt to answer that question includes, um, I wanted to include my world growing up with all of its confusion and lies and magic. And in that way, you actually get a visceral sense of, I don't know, how I constructed the person that I constructed. And, you know, I think we think of these things as tropes or devices of fiction and they don't belong in memoir. Like if you were to read like Art of Memoir by Mary Carr, yeah. like page one, you must trust everything the narrator says. Always, always. And I'm like, yeah. no, you don't. That's not true at all. I mean, I, I love so interesting Carr. because your book does have a really, it has a specific and kind of unusual relationship to the truth. And I don't mean it's veracity. I mean, I believe that everything that you wrote did indeed happen to you, but because it seems like you are getting at some deeper emotional truths. Um, and you are using some of those conventions that, that are more from fiction. Right, and um, that, that's, that's it, because I, I believe that, let's just take magical realism. You know, yeah. magical realism is how we construct our identities. Why do you think people like astrology? Why does totemic um, religion exist? Why does religion exist? Why, you know, we, we construct our world around metaphor. We all yeah. know what our spirit animal is or who our guides are or what, you know, we, we don't, we think about the world in these ways and we very much think about them this way as children. And yeah. so my perspective was, okay, let's present that whole, let's not take this kind of elegiac, I'm 40, I'm looking back on my life. Let me tell you the conclusions and don't get me wrong. That is, that is a perfectly acceptable way to, to write a memoir, but I, I wanted to challenge the form to the point where I'm saying almost, I don't care about the truth. I care about the truth, the emotional truth. I care about the ontological truth. Right. I, when you get done with this book, I promise you, you're going to know how this world was for me. And I will not have told you a lie, except for the lies that I wanted you to figure out were lies. Because that's how, how you I think, experienced yeah. the world. Yeah. That's what I was, I was told a lot of lies that I thought were true. And so I wanted the readers to be told the same lies. Yeah. And how did you conceive of this really interesting structure of, I think it's four distinct sections and it's not just that you're writing as the adult memoirist looking back here's Mikhail at five here's Mikhail you're actually writing from, from kind of the psycho emotional state of mm -hmm. Mikhail at five and right. Mikhail at as a teenager and Mikhail at these various ages of course always in a way in dialogue with adult Mikhail totally that's yeah. exactly right Jessica very astute <laughs> you, I'm telling you, you, you read the book. I told, I was telling Jessica this before we got on that. I feel like her reading of the book is the kind of reading that every writer longs for, where you just hope to be seen for all the little things that you're trying to do. Um, and yeah, I, I guess I felt that um, uh, there's four different voices, um, at least four different voices, but four distinct sections. The book is really three books. 
I mean, in a lot of ways, it's not, it's not one book, it's three books. And because the first two sections go together, um, mm -hmm. Escape and Oregon are kind of one section, California, different section, Hollywood Park. So it's, it's a long book and it's probably should have been, I could have serialized it, I don't know. But um, that, and each one has its own voice, its own sentence structure, its own vocabulary. And I think that's right. If, if there's a perspective of a five-year-old, but it would be really boring to listen to a five-year-old uh, talk, you know? And so what, what I'm really trying to do is um, bring to life the emotional world of a five-year-old. And sometimes I do that by actually sounding like a five-year-old. And sometimes what I, I do that um, by expressing what the five-year-old is thinking in words that the five-year-old probably wouldn't have chosen. Um, but I'm now the 40-year-old writer in dialogue with the five-year-old, I'm trying to give the five-year-old a voice. So really, yeah, the perspective of the book is, is one in which dialogue, uh, there's a dialogue between the, the younger self and, and the older self. And again, these are, these, you know, there's a difference between perspective and point of view. Um, and I, the point of view is of a five-year-old, but the perspective is really of the, of the adult writer, because I think as the, as the, as you move on, the, I think the reader, I hope anyway, sort of very quickly figures out, oh, this kid's being lied to. Oh, this kid's being fucked with. Oh, this kid's, you know, and, and, and to experience it viscerally by hearing those same lies being repeated, I feel like it's, is, is more powerful. Cause again, that's not why, that's not why stories work in fiction. That's because that's how stories work. Right. That's how people work. Yeah. We, every good story has a perspective and it, and it's filled with distortion. Cause how could it not be? Right. That's what makes it a perspective. Right. And was it ever particularly challenging kind of those, uh, the conflict between writing from the emotional state of your younger self and being in dialogue? I'm, I'm thinking of particular scenes like the really powerful one, not long after you had left Synanon and you're in Berkeley and then you experience a tr really traumatic act of violence that uh, someone who was, I think a roommate in your house was beaten up really violently by some guys right in front. So imagine you're, you're kind of going back through the sense memories of that. And at the same time, you're reflecting on it as an adult. I know it was also covered in the press and kind of how you deal with kind of unspooling all of that. Um, yeah, it was challenging. Um, I, 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 I knew that story well. I'd heard that story growing up. I'd been lied to about that story growing up. I'd also later discovered the story and discovered the lies. And then I actually, in writing the book, just did interviews. Um, so that I could get other people's perspective on on the day. Um, and yeah, we, we were living in Berkeley on Spalding Street. We had gone there to hide. Um, we were living on food stamps. We had just escaped the cult because it had turned violent. We weren't allowed outside. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd always told the bad men are coming, the bad men are coming. And so one day the bad men came and they beat our roommate, who was sort of like a father figure, uh, into a coma. He was in a coma for a month uh, and he, they beat him unconscious you know, five feet in front of me. Um, and it was, it was, it was, it was traumatizing. And I do have some very specific memories of weirdly enough, his face is the thing I remember most. Um, and I have like a blur of like a, of the ambulance and I feel like memory is a fog and anyone who doesn't say that is full of shit. You just kind of have to acknowledge, you know, what the fog of your memory is. Yeah. And there's different ways to interrogate that. And I think different memoirs handle it in different ways. And some, the worst ones are the ones that are like, here's the truth. Here's what happened. That's what I, I like. That's my least favorite type of memoir. Um, there's some really interesting memoirs that'll do things like, here's how I remember it. Here's what the fog is telling me. And here's my way of interrogating that memory. Mm -hmm. And for me, I, I went this whole other direction, which was, here's my completely subjective truth. And I'm going to just clue you in on how subjective this is from day one, from like opening page when my mom turns into a bird and flies away. You're like, okay, that's some subjective shit. <laughs> like yeah. no one ever turned into a bird and flew away, but that's sort of my, my contract with the readers. I'm going to tell you as the world looked from the center of my skull. So for that day, um, it felt really important to just, just try and capture it uh, as, as I, as I witnessed it. Um, and, and those sorts of things were difficult. I, I, I had to spend a lot of time in writing the book, thinking about the voice, thinking about the world. I had to, I had to do some world building before I started the book where I would go to different places and I would reflect upon the place and write down everything I remembered. I called them brain dumps and I would do them about different places and create sort of a, ma a map of the place. Uh, and I did it for every major you know, locale in the book. 
Tony Morrison has this wonderful idea about rememory that there's like the that memories live in places. And so I would go to places and just try to find the memories. And then I would reflect on the memories. I'd spend a few days writing and then I would call people and do interviews that of people who were there and compare notes. And then I'd kind of have that part of the world built. And then when I went back to write, I could just think about the problem of how do I solve the problem of writing in this voice? How do I solve the problem of transitions and intros and, and think about all the writerly things instead of having to yeah. try to remember like what color was the, the van and what, yeah. where, how high was the house and where, you know, like, cause all that had already been done in this document that for each place was like a 40 page document that had all the, all the details. You mentioned uh, what you hate about some memoirs and I'm curious if there are some that you really latched onto and loved um, oh, yeah. either previous in your life or in preparation. You said you read, uh, I think you said 150 books as you yeah, were about that. up to do this. I mean, I'm curious about Tobias Wolf, maybe. Yeah. Um, I, I love This Boy's Life, of course. Um, I would say This Boy's Life in Angela's Ashes um, for the same reason. Um, I mean, they're different kinds of books, but what I loved about them was how much they clued the reader in and how much scheming these boys were doing. Yeah, it's kind of rascal kid. Yeah. Just little shits, you know, and that's what we were. We were little shits. I was a, I was a scheming little kid. But, you know, there's a more profound thing going on because, of course, you're, you're responding to these intense situations that the adults are putting you in. These very unfair situations, uh, sometimes dangerous situations, violent situations that you, you have no business being in at seven years old. So you're trying to scheme your way out of them. And also everyone else around you is a schemer and a huckster. So you just sort of figure that's how people are. So you become one too. So I love that about Tobias Wolf. Um, I love, I know why the cage bird sings. Um, my Angelou's um, memoir. It, that, that book is heartbreaking because it's, it's like, you think you got a book? You don't have a book. You don't have a book here's a book where every paragraph is poetry. Every page has just mm -hmm. such wisdom and, and beauty. And, and also she's just such a lyricist. It's just lyrical. When you read it, you just want to, it makes you want, certain writers make you want to write. She's one of those that make you want to write. Mm -hmm. um, so, so those, of course, and then I, I actually just read all the memoirs. I just read every classic, everything from, you know, I don't know, um, the year of magical thinking to, yeah, Liars Club and Glass Castle um, to all the way through, like, one day I'll write about this place, you know. Um, Sarah Westover, probably. Yeah, I read Educated. That's a good book. Yeah. Um, you know, and then, oh, and The Things That Carried was was actually, The Things That Carried by Tim O'Brien, which is actually a novel, but he says, uh, is, you know, he's pretty clear that this is a novelized version of a memoir. Like, he's like, these things all basically happen, but I had to change the names because I right. didn't want to piss people off. Um, and I'm sure he changed some other relevant details, but that book is just so heartbreaking and wonderful. And, and I think what it shares in common with um, some of the novels that I really loved um, in, cause I read a lot of novels too, in, in preparing for this book um, was that it just, it didn't dumb anything down to the reader. Tim O'Brien lets you into his mental world with all of its contradiction and all of its anguish. And there's this great moment where he's 17 years old and he's been drafted to Vietnam and he's like an honor student. He wants to go to college and he's suddenly yeah. going to go to Vietnam and he's terrified because why wouldn't he be right? Yeah. And he, and there's this great story where he runs away to the Canadian border and he's going to, and it's like a 30 page story of him going to the Canadian border, meeting this old man, staying in his lodge. They go fishing. The old man takes him to literally the Canadian border because he figures out this kid wants to draft, dodge the draft. He hadn't told anyone and he's feeling tremendous shame over this. And he gets 10 feet from the Canadian side of the river and he just starts crying. And the old man won't even look at him because he's one of these like stoic old guys who's gonna let him just kind of suffer on his own. And mm -hmm. then he eventually, you know, decides not to jump out and he goes back and he says the reason is he was too embarrassed. And he said, what a powerful thing that he would like for young men. So how many young men died in Vietnam because they were worried their friends would call him a pussy if uh -huh. they didn't go. And that that's such a power. And like, what a thing to admit, what a thing to bring to life for a reader. And also what a complex story that's and and it's in that that you really that's what's so great about Tim O'Brien is that you really see the world as you see it from the center of his of his skull. And that was so influential for me of just like, just let them know what your struggle is. Let them know how you survived that struggle. Let them know what you did. And don't don't you don't have to dumb it down. It can be exactly as complex and mysterious uh, and beguiling as it actually uh, felt when you were going through it. 
Yeah, yeah. Another way I think you subvert the conventions of memoir, I think you've said this before, that in some more traditional memoirs about kind of surviving trauma, maybe you would have ended it when you got into Stanford. Totally. I'm really so happy for you and you can be like, I survived, I made it yep. through, I'm relatively unscathed. <laughs> you know, and you really didn't take that route. And well, I wanted to. <laughs> I, I really, I think my first draft did. And then my agent, Susan Gollum is my oh. agent and she's a wonderful editor. And I, I'd given it to her. I didn't, I, I, I didn't have her by the way, uh, in, at the start of the book. Like I, I sat and wrote here for like two and a half years before. I, in I, the room I, where you are now. In this room where I am, yeah. No <laughs> agent, no publisher, no editor, just me. Um, and I felt like I was just building something um, that I wasn't sure was ever gonna see the light of day. Um, and so I'd given uh, my first draft, which was really my like eighth draft to Susan. Um, and she read it and she said, I love all this. And I also want to know what happened mm -hmm. because there was, I, I think I did essentially end it at 18. I did some other stuff, but I essentially ended at 18 because there was this feeling like, oh, I got out. I survived. I, are you kidding me? I, I was born in an orphanage in a cult. My father was a, a, a heroin addict, an ex-con with an eighth grade education. My mother's mentally ill. We survive on food stamps. We run away from violence. We, you know, there's, there's an alcoholic stepfather that dies. There's another one that's abusive. And I get a scholarship to Stanford. Like it's this great, I mean, it's kind of like this boy's life in that way, but maybe a little more, a little darker, but yeah. there's an arc there, right? Where you say, yeah. I got out. And I think I had every right in the world to, to say mm -hmm. that. And I think at 21, I thought that. Yeah. Well, and I'm so glad you pushed through that. I mean, I also think as a reader, and I'm curious if, if this is true, I would imagine that some of the later chapters after that were maybe emotionally even more challenging to write. Cause that's when you really get into uh, your ideas of manhood and what it is to to feel damaged and and yep. you know why you keep pushing people away why you feel kind of lingering pain and loneliness and those are really that's really true vulnerability to write about that that was hard yeah. i'm not gonna lie that was much harder the, the hardest chapter was the chapter on stanford followed by the chapter called broken which is the one about coming to terms with, that was when my brother got clean off heroin and then I sort of realized through his journey that I was sort of emotionally broken as well. But those two chapters were actually much harder to write than witnessing violence at five-year-old because if you witness violence at five years old, if you're abused by a step-parent or a parent or whatever, there's such a clear dialectic where you're the victim. Um, and, and some of those things were hard to write because some of the ways in which we were abused were sort of nuanced and kind of hard to talk about. But so I, it's not quite that simple. But mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say is that the um, it was much harder to talk about the ways I didn't emerge unscathed. Yeah. And then to deal like this, the chapter on Stanford was the hardest one for me to write. And that was, you know, that in that chapter, my, my mother goes to a, a essentially a mental uh, institution or, you know, a recovery place. She has a nervous breakdown. And Man, that stuff's a lot harder to admit and to talk about. And and I and I, there was just kind of the the writer in me saying, probe this, like yeah. think about this, talk about this. I've obviously spent years thinking about it, having mm -hmm. this whole world. And I and I sort of innately understood that that would make for exciting writing because I would be taking risks. Mm -hmm. And I did that for a while. And then um, it wasn't until the book actually was about to come out that it occurred to me, like, oh my god, that's a lot to tell the world. Yeah. Yeah, the writer in me is just a bully. It's like, I don't care about your personhood. I want a good story. You know, right. just that bully, right. like get the good story, get the good story that, you know, do Tim O'Brien, do Tony Morrison, probe the shame, probe the, the desolation and the depression and the suicidal thoughts and get inside them and really tell me a story. Give me your fucking humanity. Cause that's what you want from a book. You want a pound right. of flesh. You right. don't want some horse shit. Readers aren't stupid. They know. Readers can sense bullshit. And one of those incredibly powerful scenes is the one um, with your TA. So you're taking Philip Zimbardo's psychology of mind control class and you write a term paper on your experiences in Synanon and yeah. she takes you aside and, and kind of tells you, I think for the first time that what you must have is an attachment disorder and it yeah. kind of breaks you down and also gives you kind of, I think, a conceptual sort of clinical framework for what you were experiencing and likely what all the kids of Synanon were experiencing. Well, and yes and no, because I didn't really take it. I didn't know how to take it seriously because it was just kind of this prescription. And I right. think I said in the book, it was sort of like you're falling off a cliff and someone's like, 
it's like a disembodied voice being like, you are currently falling off a cliff. <laughs> you're like, what okay. do I do? Yeah. Where's yeah, the parachute? Pretty yeah. soon you're going to hit the ground and die. Okay. What do I do? And right. yeah, that the attachment disorder um, is um, it's a tough thing to, to admit because, you know, if you have an attachment disorder, you're, you're not a good boyfriend. And I think at that point in my life, and probably for years after, I, I wasn't a good boyfriend. I was very capricious. I had, I was, I was, I was a serial monogamist. I wasn't one of these guys that was like, you know, Chuck Bukowski player type dudes. That wasn't my my thing. My thing was, I, I actually did get into very serious relationships, and then I and then I'd leave, and then I'd come back, and then I'd leave, and then I'd come back, and it was kind of uh, in popular parlance, it was in pop culture, uh, Goodwill Hunting, that mm. movie is about a person with an an orphan with an attachment disorder so that's that thing where he can't actually allow someone to be close to him and he has to leave and and she she was like yeah that's that's because you were an orphan and it was so I'm like, curious if you heard from her so I had an email that I wanted to read to you so I guess my the story I wrote on you came out Zimbardo sent it to her she's this TA she's now a poli sci professor mm -hmm. at Brown and she wanted to get in touch with you and if I could just read this because yeah. I, I it might make you smile. She writes, I was Mikkel's TA in that psych of mind control class. I remember him vividly, but I had no idea he had become famous in some rock band. He was a remarkable standout. Even then, I absolutely remember that conversation we had in that corner office of Phil's suite. He cried like a baby. He went through a lot. What I remember most was that he got his nose pierced and it kept getting infected and he simply would not take it out. <laughs> Funny the things you remember. What an amazing kid. <laughs> it was the 90s. <laughs> All right. The nose piercing was a punk rock thing. I, you know, <laughs> a lot of guys in punk bands had a thick nose piercing. I'd shaved purple hair and wore like, you know, cut off Doc Martens at the knees and one stars. And yeah, <laughs> it was like a skater nose piercing. I want you to understand there was a distinction is it was punk rock. It wasn't, uh, I don't know. It, like that doesn't happen now. Yeah. She was, um, she was really sweet. She was, kind and gentle and i you know a lot of stanford I, it was confusing for me because i i didn't know how different i was from everybody else until i got there yeah. or was i just had never seen so many white people because like i talk as i write your high school was predominantly black right like yeah. 80 percent black and and the other 20 like the other 20 percent was mostly mexican or salvadorian or guatemalan or whatever and there was like, there were not that many white kids. It's funny because my yearbook, I'm the only non-black face on the page. If you look at my yearbook, every person on the page is black. And then there's one white kid like, like <laughs> just look at his Zach from Saved by the Bells could be just, you know. And I think um, at the time, uh, and so people would say, oh, your high school is diverse. I'm like, it wasn't diverse. It was a black <laughs> school. Right. I loved it though. I loved my black high school. <laughs> I never code switched. I was never one of these people that's like, yeah, I'm down with the car. Like, I just, I, it wasn't my thing. Um, but um, I loved having um, other kids who were going through what I was going through. You know, my dad had been in prison. We'd have been in food stamps. I'd had a single mom. Like, we could relate. Yeah. And I couldn't relate about the racial stuff, obviously, because I'm, I'm white and I got white privilege and all that. Um, but I, I certainly felt a lot of empathy. Yeah. You know, my reaction to it was like, man, well, why don't you give these people a break? These guys are going through a lot. These, these, these people are going through a lot. So it was cool to be part of the struggle. It felt cool. I loved the black parents. There were, I was on the track team and there was all these great black parents and they'd always invite me over before track meets or after track meets, they had little parties. And I was like part of the family and um, they would pray for us and that sort of black gospel, the Baptist kind of way. Cause there's a lot of Southern, a lot of the black people from LA are actually originally from the South. That's just one of the demographic thing it has to do with the factories in South Central LA the, and the my great migration in the thirties and forties. Um, so it was just, um, I loved it. And so I, and I felt my story wasn't that uncommon. Right. I was trying to get out. I was trying to get up. I was trying to, and I was working hard, like Tremaine and Jabari and Dakari, like these were my friends. They were, they were doing the same as me. Like, let's get to that calculus final. Let's ace it. Cause we, they wanted to go to Harvard or Yale or Stanford or, and just get out of the situation they were in. And so when I got to college, suddenly I lost the veneer I, I wasn't there. If I'd been there with Dakarai and Tremaine and Jabari, I think they'd all been like, oh, how's Mikhail doing? Because I, you know, we're in the, we're in a similar boat, not with the racial stuff. And again, I'm a white dude. I have white privilege. I'm not saying that. I'm, but there was a sense of like, okay, we're doing a similar thing. But I got to college and then I just looked like a white guy. Mm -hmm. 
and I would, and there was like, it was the height of the PC thing. So I remember the first orientation, there was, there was, there was the black student union lunch, which I really wanted to go to, by the way. I really wanted to live in Uj, but Ujima, which was the black dorm, but I couldn't because I just looked like the crackerish cracker. And like, there was the, there was the Mecha lunch, um, which is the, the Latino organization. Um, uh, there was like the Asian Pacific Islander lunch. And th there was the Native American lunch. And then there was lunch. <laughs> Yep. yep. And they may as well have called it white lunch because <laughs> all it was left was just white people. And I would go to, and I went to white lunch and I remember being at white lunch, like the first week with like a bunch of dudes from like New Hampshire with like game hats on and frayed flannels that went to like Exeter or some shit. And I'm like, like, what do I have in common with these people? I'm like, grow up as essentially well, poor white trash. I guess you could say that. And then go to all black schools and I finally made it. I got a scholarship to Stanford and I'm sitting across from like Chad from fucking Exeter. And it, what do we talk about? Mayonnaise? What do we talk about? Banana Republic? Like what? We have nothing in common. There's nothing. And so it was just disorienting and weird. And I'm at Stanford and, it, and so to have um, uh, my TA, yeah. I don't know. I felt, yeah, I guess I felt seen and I felt like, oh, she she saw that there's early struggle and these early struggles really define my life in this very important way so it was it was actually a really wonderful thing yeah because you told me before i mean you really stopped talking about these stories for a long time you didn't like the reactions you got yeah. you, didn't, you know um, but you you don't want to um i think at some point um i felt like i didn't want to be somehow branded by my parents choices to do these things that i i'm not as far like I'm not as much of a believer and a joiner as my parents. Boomers are notoriously believers and joiners. Yeah. And I'm, I'm Generation X. We're practical. Yeah. I believe in the power of institutions and trying to sway those institutions towards helping people, you know, and I, yeah. I was a straight A student and I worked hard and I always wanted to, and, and I didn't, I, I got sick of like, if I told someone, yeah, I was born in a cult and, you know, raised in an orphanage, like I, that's, people look at you like you're a, like you're a wild dog you know, off a leash. And, and I don't blame them. I guess it sounds just very otherizing and strange. And I, I didn't want people to, to look at me. So I just stopped when I was about 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And what's funny is I have old friends that I've had since junior high. I have a group of friends that I've been friends with since I was 11. Um, or, you know, and they're in the book and, and a couple of them have read the book and just called me or uh, we did a social distance hang recently and they were just crying. Mm -hmm. They're just like, I had no idea. Wow. Like, went through and I was like and they were like why didn't you tell me and I was like I just um I just didn't want to I didn't want I didn't want to be thought of in that way you yeah. know really makes us wonder all the other secrets that maybe friends and acquaintances are carrying around 100 percent. and and I want to say I think that I have these sort of fantastical elements to my story because my father was in prison and my mother's mentally ill and we were in a cult and we escaped and all these things that sound really fantastical but Really, the heart of it was these really mundane things that I think are very, very common. Mental illness, addiction, loneliness, um, you know, emotional abuse, physical abuse. These things are, there's plenty of people in the suburbs dealing with this. There's plenty of people that are just a junior at manual arts high school in South Central LA that are going through crazy trauma. Yeah. Uh, and who could also own. benefit from plumbing the emotional depths of their story. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. And they have a story in them as well that's at least as, you know, um, vivid as mine. Mm -hmm. I'd love to know if you could share a little bit more about your writing process because it sounds incredibly immersive, which seems fitting to the book because it's a really immersive read. It just kind of swallows you whole. And you talked about writing long days. I think in the space that you're in, a lot of reading. A lot, a lot of, of reading. writing. Yeah. Um, so my process is pretty hardcore. Um, I've been told. I don't, you have to understand, I don't know. I never studied writing uh, in college or anything. I, I, I was a reader um, and, I was, and I was a writer before I was in a writer band. Too, yeah. I was a, I was a, I, I, I had a pretty promising writing career that I threw away to start a rock band. <laughs> I'd had fiction published in McSweeney's. I was an on-air columnist. Yeah, on your way to Yaddo, right? Yeah, I was on my way to Yaddo to finish, to turn the McSweeney's piece into a, a novel. Um, and um, I had a, I had a bunch of sort of early success in writing. And then I threw it all away, to flush it all down the toilet to start a rock band. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but my process when I came back to it um, is, is um, I would read, oh, and during the intervening years, read a lot. But I never studied these books. I never studied white noise. I didn't take literature in college. It felt like cheating. And I didn't want books to ever be work. 
I wanted them to be play. I wanted them to be, this is what I'm, do I'm doing something wrong because I'm reading Portnoy's complaint. I mean, that book, it's probably kind of the whole point of it, but like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's how I related to it. Yeah. And it could, it could be like the trial. Like it, it was like, I've read the trial five times because I just love, I just love how just subversive and weird it all is. And it's like, if I had studied it, I don't think I'd have that same relationship to it. So, you know, it's like yeah. Kafka's one of my buddies because he's such a fucking anarchist. <laughs> um, but um, so when I, my writing process is, yeah, it's six days a week. Um, I have to, I have to, uh, you know, 5 a.m. big cup of coffee um, right until about, you know, right four or five hours. I have a word goal every day. Um, late morning to, you know, early afternoon, take a break, do some editing, maybe have some lunch and then read for four to five hours every afternoon. And I have to read where I can't write the next day. So I did that six days a week uh, for about two and a half years. Um, I did 12 drafts. And when I say drafts, I mean fully printed out manuscripts that I went over line by line with a pen. Wow. And cut entire pages, wrote tons of notes. It's all scribbled. I can show it to you. Like it's all scribbled on. And I did that 12 different times. Okay. And about halfway through um, the writing, I... I, re I, I think I had this moment where I thought I, this could be something special. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me that in order to make it as special as the specialist, if I, I the, the challenge was how do I make the entire book as special as the, the most special parts are now? Mm -hmm. And that I knew was an editing process. And I wrote about three times as much. I wrote about 500,000 words. Um, oh and, my God. Yeah, yeah. And then cut, uh, cut it down to 140,000. Wow. And you're working on a novel now? I, I, I wouldn't say I'm working on a novel. I would say I'm considering a novel. Okay. I'm kind of taking the summer off. I thought I'd be on tour. And so it's, it's been this very disorienting thing to suddenly just be home and be like, yeah. well, and to just be like, okay, start a novel. So I don't, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I don't feel. And I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about that. I mean, it's so unusual that you've created an album that's kind of a soundtrack to the book. Um, just how you even conceived of that. I'm sure people would love to know. Um, well, the, the, um, it was kind of, um, it, I think it seems more ordered in retrospect, or, mm -hmm. but we're really kind of placing some order on something that was actually very chaotic. I just, I would write and then sometimes I would just be so much in the mind of the time or the child or whatever. And that I would write a song from the perspective of the time I would just spent the last you know month immersed in. And right. so then eventually I had like 30 songs like that. Uh, Cause I just kind of write songs that songs are never feel like they're a career thing or a decision to, they're just like how I get through the day is sometimes I write songs. Do you and, play music as a break from your writing? Like, do you get stumped and pick up your guitar and. I, again, it's, I think that that's probably a little more ordered than it actually is. I mean, I think some days I just want to play guitar or want to yeah. sing or work on stuff, but the book I will say was, um, was a much more immersive process. I'm, like it was, it was a good two and a half years of, steady concentration that I didn't take a lot of breaks from that um, was was much harder than I thought it would be but then kind of weirdly rewarding like I really kind of liked after eight years on the road living in a bus on a rock band like this sort of I liked the kind of solitary scholastic challenge of it it was there was something really cool about that and the idea of writing the novel next it's a dystopian ish love story thing I don't know it's science fiction but is um is the idea of kind of being in that place is exciting of just um uh you know when you're in a rock band you're always out with people you're always shaking hands and signing autographs and singing and yeah. doing sound checks and you meet like 100 people a day and you know i like the sort of solitary existence after doing that for for so long since you have these kind of hermetic tendencies has it made the pandemic easier for you i mean that you're well I mean, if i was working on something it might maybe i will say it's not been that different yeah, it sounds like it. <laughs> like I'm locked in a room. <laughs> like, well, yeah. I see Jamie says that there are some great questions out there. So I think we should open it up to. to yeah, wonderful. Time. Okay. Is Jamie going to come back? Oh, yeah, sure. She is. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. And I hate to, you know, kind of cut in, but we've got lots of great feedback, um, a few pretty in depth questions. So I wanted to go ahead and throw those out there. Um, so the first question, Patricia is wondering, uh, one of the assignments in the artist's way by Julia Cameron is to reimagine your childhood. 
Is there any way you would change your childhood after having written your memoir? Oh man. Um, that's a great question. I don't know. It's sort of like the, one of these, I don't know if other people have this thought. Do you guys ever have the thought of like, if I could go back to being born again, but I just know everything I know now, would that be just amazing? And I could be like the smartest kid ever and not make any mistakes. Or would it just be horrible? Cause you'd feel trapped in this like kid's body while everyone doesn't take you seriously or anything. Um, I, I think one thing I will say is that writing the book has, has given me a lot more empathy for my brother and kind of what he went through. Um, and when I'm, I think if you'd asked me five years ago, how was, how was your brother as a kid? I would have said he was a bully. He was a jerk. He pinned me down and put me in headlocks. And, and then in writing the book, I realized everything I'd gone through, he'd gone through worse. He was in an orphanage for seven years. He was abused. He was no one, no one, he never had a minute of therapy. No one ever asked him how he was dealing with stuff. And he was, he was angry. And so I will say when I, when I go back and I read sort of like what my brother was saying, cause I remember him very vividly saying all the things he says in the book, cause he was always very angry against the adults. I think maybe I'd have, I'd probably have more of his perspective that, Hey, this is, this is wrong. What, what are you guys doing? This isn't okay. This is, and that was kind of what he was saying. Um, so I, yeah, probably I'd be, I'd be a lot angrier with the adults as opposed to, I think my choice was to try to pretend like everything was fine. Wow. Um, an anonymous attendee just wants to thank you for your feedback. Um, she says she can so relate similar histories, mad respect and deep appreciation for his art. Cannot wait to read this book. So that was, you know, just one I wanted to, to give to you. Um, a second question we have is um, this person's interested in what your relationships are like now. Oh, um, with uh, with my family or just like or just kind of all the all the above that's personal but you know you can kind of choose which um i um I, well i've been mostly estranged from my birth mother uh since this like there's a scene in the book where i write her a letter and say i don't really want to like talk and that that's been true since i was about 19 years old um so uh that's still true um, there were some moments where I sort of tried to reconnect. It didn't quite work out for all the reasons that I outlined in the book. And so um, that's, that's the same. And that, that one's tough because, you know, um, you sort of, I think where I've come, I've landed with it. It's that um, I can't not care about her. It's that she wasn't that good at about at caring about us. And I think if you're a child that's, that's, that's been abused, that's a tricky uh, thing to, it's a tricky conclusion to come to because you still care. You still sort of long for the moment when the, when the person, maybe they read your book or maybe they, you know, hear about something and they, and they call you or they write you a long letter saying, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I didn't know that you felt this way and I'm so sorry, but it's, it's really a childish wish. Uh, Cause the, like the, the adult in me knows that's just never, never going to happen. And I have to sort of be like, well, why do you want that to happen? And then the answer is, um, cause I cared about her. And I think as kids, we love our parents, um, even if they're not good to us. And, and to try to lock that line, is, it's sort of like so much of it's always like, well, you know, do you love me? Are you my kid? Do you love me? I'm like, yeah, you didn't love me. Um, or if you did, you expressed it in a way that was, man, it was, it was really hard to live with. Uh, my brother and I are hanging, I texted with my brother 10 minutes, like before going, like my brother and I hang out all the time. We're still buds. Um, probably a stronger relationship now than ever, probably partially because of this. He's been just so supportive and great. Uh, my mom, Bonnie, um, who's was my stepmom, but we don't use the S word um, in the family. Um, I, I, I see her every Sunday for a social distance hang, <laughs> you know, and look and check in on her because she's a widow living alone. And my wife and I have a second kid now and we're going strong and just trying to survive like everyone else. That's great. Thanks for answering that. I know it's kind of personal. Um, I don't mind. If you write a memoir, you have to be prepared. <laughs> right. You can't be like, Hey, now. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so this next question is, is a little bit long and also kind of personal. So That's okay. to answer what you will. Um, he says, I hope this isn't too personal, but I was wondering if you ever had a chance to talk to your dad about the emotional abuse you experienced from your birth mother. Did he experience any gaslighting or manipulation with her as well? 
there's a little bit more. In the book, your mother talks about your father several times, but I don't recall your father ever mentioning her. Did you talk to him about what you went through? Thanks. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I did once. Um, it was before he died. Um, and we, we'd, we'd um, this was actually originally one, of, this is one of the chapters that got cut. Um, and there was, a, there was a chapter, there was actually about, I don't know, 10,000 words, which I don't know what that is, and you know, 50 pages or something um, about my father's time in the hospital that I cut, that in the book now is those two pages, just that say like, and then he's gone, you know, it's just kind of text art. And I thought that was stronger than the 10,000 words I had written about, you know, my father's time in the hospital. So there was a time around then when my dad and I, I would go and I'd stay up with him and we knew he was dying and we knew we had weeks to live. Um, and it was just the two of us. And, you know, he couldn't sleep because of the medication that he was on. And we had some long talks um, about the family and about his dad and about my mom and about my brother and all these things that he kind of hadn't really told me about, he told me about. Um, and um, one of the things that he told me was that he just never wanted me to have a negative idea of my mom because he knew that I couldn't help but feel like that was part of myself. And so he, to his credit, after all of that, never once said a negative word. Now, in retrospect, I think if he knew the extent of what was going on, he probably would have just said, you can't have those kids. Those, those boys need to come live with me because he was very protective. I don't think he knew. And also my mom, Bonnie, uh, would say that they didn't know how bad it, we had it in Oregon, how much abuse was happening and that kind of thing. Um, and... Um, uh, but I, I think his instinct was to to not have me feel bad about her um, because then he knew I would, in some way, that would mean I'd feel bad about myself. And I think it's very common with children. Um, if you criticize the parent, you can't help but internalize that. Thanks so much for answering that. Um, we have another little bit of feedback. Um, she says, hello, and thank you all. She just finished the audiobook, and damn, it was wonderful. Listen to it on, a long, on long car rides, so can't go back to the book to check my gut feeling, but it felt like I heard lines from some of the old non-Hollywood Park songs in some of the text. Did, uh, did, did he leave Easter eggs for fans? Examples are the way he explained Robert Smith. All your songs are sad songs, like in his song, Elizabeth, and later he painted scene that sounded just like the visuals for the timeless video, old men with hats, papers flying on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> that was a deep cut. Yeah. Um, the short answer is no. <laughs> I hadn't thought of any of that. Um, but maybe there's just kind of a, um, you know, a metaphorical, visual, emotional world that I inhabit. And if I'm going to write a 500,000 words of book that I'm, I'm destined to run into some of the same imagery that I, I had written before, but that is, um, <laughs> I mean, first of all, just kudos to you for being such an attentive person, but no, I hadn't, I hadn't considered any of that. I like the idea of the, the men on the beach though. That's a good one. Like I, I think they're talking about the scene where, where we're at the show and it's like the people are walking into the waves and the men, the wind is the hitting the trousers of the men and the women have their dresses fanning behind them. Like, in the, in the waves and we're all just kind of walking into the ocean together. And I will say that that is a really potent image in my mind that I affiliate with touring with the Airborne Toxic event. So many shows have felt like that where you, it just feels like we're all just walking into a place together. And sometimes that place is, you know, death and sometimes it's rebirth and sometimes it's the ocean. I don't know, but like this sense of like collective um, movement um, it's really, I feel like it's really strong at our shows for whatever reason. And so, yeah, maybe that just that idea fascinates me or something. You know, I'll say that's a testament to get the uh, audio book. That's for sure. That's right. <laughs> you can get it at Copperfields. Yeah. Um, so we have just two more. I'm going to try and squeeze in. I want to, you know, be respectful of your time. Uh, well, can I just say if those of you, um, if you, if you want to purchase the book, uh, please do so at Copperfields, not on Amazon. Um, 
appreciate that. <laughs> As they have sponsored this event um, and uh, because of COVID-19, it's hit them much harder uh, than Amazon. And they're wonderful people who love books like you. We love that. Thank you. Um, okay, last couple of questions. Did any part of this writing drop you down the inner well of intense grief or old shame? And on yeah. that note, did you have residual shame about your history? If so, how did you heal a bulk, a bulk of that so that you can live your adult life with this freedom? Yeah, um, that's a great question. It's a very insightful question. Um, it absolutely did. Um, I just, I, I would say in writing the book, well, really it was when I started therapy, um, but also when writing the book, I, I had rediscovered this tremendous amount of grief I had over Paul, my first stepdad, that I had never processed. And, and I think that's really clear in the pages. <laughs> Um, this, how tragic this, this early relationship I had was with my stepdad, who was this kind man who was, you know, he's just, he, he was, he sat and watched cartoons with us in his underwear and took us fishing and hiking and talked to us and played with us and did Legos. And he was just a kind, warm man in a house that didn't have a lot of warmth. And he was a very severe alcoholic and he disappeared one day and we never talked about it. And he was with us for five years. He was with us from the time I was five till I was 10. We never talked about it. It's like very, I mean, imagine five years of your life from particularly those five years. Uh, and then, you know, sometime around then, maybe a year later, I was told he, he, um, he died. And that was also mentioned in passing. Um, and so I, I think I had this intense grief that I just never, never had dealt with, never recognized. I loved this man. I loved Paul. He was just a good guy. So yeah, and then as far as shame, writing about shame is hard. Americans don't do well with shame. I feel like the French and Germans, they're better with shame. They're kind of fine with it. They're just like, yeah, it's part of what you are, you have shame, you know? Americans are, have this kind of puritanical culture where we pretend shame doesn't exist. And particularly the chapter about Oregon, I had so much shame wrapped up in, you know, realizing I'd been an orphan, so much shame wrapped up in realizing I, I'd sort of you know, had a mother that was dealt with mental illness. That was hard for me. Uh, and I think that's, that's the only time in my life I was, I was ever suicidal. And that was, that was why, um, yeah, it was absolutely, it was hard to deal with. Um, I will say this, I had a lot of what's called fear of exposure before the book came out um, where I was just so much anxiety about like, what's going to happen. All these people are going to know all my secrets. And then when they know my secrets, they're going to see me. And then when they see me, they're going to hate me. <laughs> Um, that's the feeling in a weird way though. It's not been that at all. It's been very freeing. Um, I had a, I had dinner with Tara Westover in New York. Uh, oh, wow. Beginning of this year. Um, we're just sort of friendly and, and, and she had said, you know, buckle up, you know, <laughs> it's hard, uh, to have so many people know so much about, um, you know, your life. That's something that actually is sort of difficult. Um, as a person who writes really confessional songs, I, I feel like I, I was like, I, I've been dealing with this for like a decade already. <laughs> like it, this was different though. Um, and I was just terrified. I could hardly sleep. I was very anxious. And then once it came out, I just kind of felt fine. And then it's and in a weird way, it's freeing. I feel like I don't have a lot of secrets. You know, I don't have much to hide and, and I, I don't mind that people sort of see like my inner world, um, particularly because I got to present it to them. I got to create the world and I got to make it, you know, not just have the sadness and the shame or whatever, but the, the beauty and the tragedy and the, and the humor and jokes. And I'm kind of fine with meeting people on the like windswept plane of page 200. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Which is a very different place than a coffee shop or a kitchen or something like the windswept plane of page 200. You can really get into some um, interesting ideas and metaphors and, 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 a, and a kind of communication with a reader that is very hard to have, you know, with a person that you've just sort of talked to in real life. So in a weird way, I feel like my friends know me better. Uh, people who don't, people who maybe I've never met, maybe know me better in a way because they, and they're, and they, I kind of sense they're a little more gentle. I think I, I can be, um, I can come off as sort of larger than life sometimes. And that's sort of the, the orphan kid dancing for, you know, trying to show everyone just how special he is. And, and since the book has come out, there's, there's a little bit more, I just feel kind of more comfortable in my own skin. Like this is who I am and uh, for better or for worse, this is, this is what happened and I'm okay with it. Oh my goodness. Well, 
an anonymous attendee said, tell him we love him more now and please promote it in Europe as it is four in the morning there. Oh, so, right. I mean, it's so fantastic to hear you share about this book. And it was, it was really great. And, um, you know, for the healing and liberation that it provided you, I don't think you can imagine how that works for people reading your book. I mean, even as we're seeing here. So it's, it was fantastic. I thank both you and Mike, or you and Jessica for being with us this evening and taking the time. Thank you for your shout out for Copperfields. And I wanna thank all of those who attended this event. I will be sending around a follow-up email tomorrow that will include a link to this recording. It will also include links for purchasing Mikael's uh, book and audio book. And um, yeah, I really appreciate you all being here and hope to see you at one of our events soon. Thank you so much for having me. And Jessica, thank you so much just for the thoughtful interviews that you've done. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Mikael. It's such a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thank likewise. You. Be well. All right, take care. Have a Bye -bye. good evening.